This document effectively prohibits the deaf from flying FPV, and it prohibits people from using FPV as a therapy for what ails them. It's, it's taking away the hobby from a really important group of people, and I don't think that is at all reasonable. G'day and welcome back to the channel. I want to talk about this advisory circular from the US Department of Transportation, Federal Aviation or Th Administration, Federal Aviation Administration. And this is um, a document that's been produced. This is a draft, I should say. So you can, it's open for consultation. You can actually make submissions on this. And I really recommend that you do go and make some submissions because this is the basically the guidelines for those organizations that will eventually be appointed as CBOs or community based organizations within the hobby. And these are the organizations under whose rules you will need to operate if you want to fly drones and model aircraft recreationally. So this is a very important document because it sets the, the shape of things to come. And it's also very important because if you're a CBO, you've really got to read this and you've got to abide by what it says, or you will not be chosen as a CBO. If you plan to be a CBO and you don't comply with this advisory circular, well, you're out of the pool. They're not going to choose you because they want these things to happen. And it's kind of worrying what's in here because in some ways it's discriminatory, but it, more importantly, it shows how lazy the FAA is and how out of touch they are with our hobby and its needs and its special requirements. And I've said for many, many years that the regulators are regulating from a position of ignorance and arrogance. And this document pretty much proves my case, proves my point. It's not just the USA. This is the same all over the world. Uh, where the US goes, the rest follow. And this is a good example of that. So let's look at some of the some of the things here that I want to talk about. Oops, let's go up here to this point. First of all, I'm going to talk about FPV. FPV is, is really important because a lot of us like to fly FPV. It's a, it's a fantastic new element of the hobby, and it's one where regulators seem to have the most problem. Now, my, many regulators may have flown toy planes when they were kids and feel, oh, we know all about the hobby. You know, we've flown model aircraft before. What's to know? It's so simple. But FPV is a bit new, and I don't think many regulators have flown FPV at all, and it shows in the ignorance of these recommendations, these guidelines in this advisory circular. So let's have a look. Let's read through this. It says, recommended safety guidelines. If a CBO supports FPV flying, well, let's face it, some of them won't. Some of them may not. If The AMA was very slow to get on the FPV bandwagon, and I don't know what they're going to do in respect to becoming a CBO. I think they'll have to embrace FPV, but they don't seem to be as warm to it as organizations, for example, like the FPV Freedom Coalition. But anyway, if, an F, if a CBO supports FPV flying, comprehensive safety guidelines should include at least the following minimum guidance for operating UAS under FPV. So this is just the starting point. They can add all the extra stuff they want, but they're going to have to include at least these points if they want to get CBO status. It says, these suggested guidelines are provided as examples to assist CBOs. CBOs should tailor the guidelines to fit their particular needs. But remember, this is a minimum. You can add stuff, but I don't think you can take stuff away. First of all, FPV flyers should be proficient in flying their UA without an FPV device prior to starting FPV flights. Now, in many cases, that's not a problem. I flew line of sight long before I flew FPV, but in it more recently, there are a lot of people getting into the hobby, especially with freestyle and racing drones, who haven't flown line of sight. And their line of sight skills can actually be pretty mediocre. There are people in our club who can fly FPV fantastically, but they cannot hover a quadcopter nose in because of the orientation issues. So that's, yeah, that's going to be an ask for some people, but I still think it's a good idea. I like flying line of sight. Number two, FPV flyers should perform pre-flight inspections of the FPV device's video control, power source, and mechanical systems before each flight. Now, this is interesting. This obviously comes from the manned aviation handbook where you do a pre-flight inspection before every flight. But in the case of models, it's normal to do one at the beginning of the day. I don't know anybody who inspects their models before each and every flight, especially FPV models. I mean, do you check every clevis? Do you check every linkage? Do you check every servo? Do you do a range test before each and every flight? I don't think anybody really does. But that's going to be one of the rules. And remember, if you don't follow the rules of the CBO, you probably, well, you're going to be in violation of the regulations. You can get all sorts of penalties. So these are the things you're going to have to do. Um, 
I don't know. I guess the, all the CBOs will put this in because it's a requirement to be a CBO, but is it going to be practically followed? I don't think it is. Is it good practice? Yes, it is. But we've got to remember, the reason that manned aviation is required to undertake all these pre-flight inspections and checks is because the pilot's life is on the line, as are their passengers and perhaps people beneath them on the ground. If something goes wrong when you're thousands of feet in the air because you didn't check a, a, a linkage or a control surface or whatever, then people can die. They can die very quickly and very fatally. So it's important to do those pre-flight checks. Now, if you're flying a 250 gram Zod Dart or FPV model um, and a, a linkage breaks, what is the worst that can happen? Well, it'll tumble to the ground. It probably won't even break it. It'll bounce. It's 250 grams of foam. Um, and most people, when you're flying FPV, you're not flying over metropolitan centers. You're not flying over busy motorways. You're flying over grassy fields. We're in a park somewhere where there's no one around. The worst that can happen is nothing. So it doesn't make sense to me to require people flying foam, toy foam planes in a grassy field to follow exactly the same requirements as someone who is placing their own life and the lives of others in danger by engaging in manned aviation. But as I said, regulators are lazy. They've taken this from the manned aviation handbook and just bonked it in here and said, yep, got to check before each flight, each flight, not just each flight session, but each flight. Well, it's not going to happen. I'll tell you now. doesn't matter what CBOs include that. People are not going to do all this before each flight. And I don't think they have to. Mind you, if you're flying a large turbine model or a big gas model, yeah, I would certainly do that pre-flight check before each flight, but not my 250 gram scale model of a Piper Cub. Not going to happen. And you'll notice there is no distinction between the different risk profiles of our models. Now, when it comes to manned aviation, everything is dangerous. Any aircraft that carries a person can cause a fatality or more than one fatality. So there is always a risk of death. With our hobby, yeah, if you're flying a turbine model at 300 miles an hour or you're flying a large gasser and there's people around, there is a very real risk to people and property. But if you're flying a 250 gram foam model of a Piper Cub, the risk is way lower. It's almost zero. So why have the same rule sets? Why have the same rules for things that can kill and things that can't even give you a scratch? It makes no sense at all. But that's what regulators do. They make no sense at all sometimes. Now, here we go. FPV operations require someone to be watching the UA at all times to ensure safe operations. This requires the use of a visual observer. Is that true? No, it's not true. It's a lie. It is, it is not necessary to have a visual observer to ensure that safe operations. Absolutely not. Example case. I'm flying on my own property, which is fenced and the gate is locked. I'm flying under some trees at barely three or four feet above the ground, negotiating through the trees, just having a bit of freestyle fun, FPV. Why do I need a visual observer? Why? There will be nobody on that piece of property because it's my property and there's no trespassing sign on the gate and the gate is locked. There's not going to be any aircraft flying underneath the tree cover in my property, or if there is, my drone's the least of their worries. So this is obviously a fiction. It is not always necessary to, re to ensure safe operations. And that's the problem. If you lie to people, I mean, most people have got ha at least half a brain. If you're going to tell them things that are blatantly untrue, don't expect them to to follow your regulations. You're bullshitting them and they will take umbrage of that. Say, what are you talking about? That's not right. And if we can't rely on you to give us factual information, how can we rely on you to give us regulations that are going to keep us safe? This is, this is a credibility thing. This is bullshit. Yeah, sometimes you do need an FPV spotter. I would never fly in, a, in an area where there's likely to be a manned aircraft coming through at the altitude I'm flying without a spotter. Never would, never would, because it's important to have that person to check out things for me. But if I'm flying in areas where there's never going to be a manned aircraft and I'm never going to pose a danger to people, an observer, a spotter, is just one more person to trip on his way to the flying field and break a leg. It's just the more people, the more risk. So if you're flying on your own, the only person who might remotely be in risk is you. And that's only if you trip on your shoelaces and, and twist your ankle. Seriously, this is bullshit. Let's go on here. Visual observers must be co-located with the FPV flyer and maintain visual line of sight with the aircraft at all times. So no flying behind trees, no dipping below contours in the ground must be visible at all times. Visual observation of the aircraft must be made with unaided vision except in the case of vision that is corrected by the use of eyeglasses or contact lenses. 
Vision aids such as binoculars may be used only momentarily to enhance situational awareness. Visual observers must be in direct communication with the FPV flyer. Now, this is one thing that I find somewhat problematic. Um, for a start, um, the visual observer is there to uh, aid situational awareness so that um, you can be aware of what's going on around you that you can't see in your camera, right? And so we have to have the visual observer to do that, to provide sufficient situational awareness that we can fly safely with our 250 gram foam, Zod, Dart or whatever, FPV, even though the consequences of that thing hitting something are zero. But we have to have a, 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 a observer to do that. However, I can jump in a full-size airplane and fly it on my own, even though I have less situational awareness. I cannot see down the, the, the floor of the aircraft's in the way. I cannot see up because the roof of the aircraft's in the way. I cannot see very far forward because there's a big cowling and a motor in the way. I can't see much out the side. In the case of a low wing, I can't see out and down because the wing's there. I can't see out and up in the case of a high wing because the wing is there. I can't see out the back because the back of the fuselage is there. I have a very limited visual field of view in a manned aircraft. But I don't need an observer sitting beside me. And remember, if my 250 gram FPV model crashes into a tree, nothing happens. Nobody dies. No property is damaged. If my Cessna 172 crashes into another aircraft because I didn't see it due to my limited situational awareness, people die. But the man of aviator doesn't need a spotter. The person flying the completely harmless FPV plane does need a spotter. Work that out. Again, no idea what they're doing. Never fly an FPV in this way. They don't understand the risk. They're not prepared to do a risk analysis. It is ridiculous. But the key line here is visual observers must be in direct communication with the FPV flyer. And we'll get to that later because that is a very important thing that discriminates against one sector of our community. Section 5, FPV flyers must have the capacity to see the aircraft at all times. Although a visual observer may be watching the UA, the FPV flyer must ensure that throughout the entire operation of the UA, he or she would have the ability to immediately see the UA if the FPV device was removed. Again, this is proof. This is proof that nobody who wrote this has ever flown FPV. Because let us paint a little picture here. It's a sunny day, you're out flying FPV with your friends, got your FPV goggles on, what happens if after you know five, six minutes of FPV flight, you take those goggles off on a bright sunny day? Well, you're kind of dazzled by the daylight, the sunlight, aren't you? Your goggles have a much lower light intensity than sunlight. So when you put them on, your eyes adapt, your pupils dilate, more light enters your eye, you can see the image. If you suddenly take those goggles off, you've got full sunlight all around you going into your eyes. First of all, you squint because the level of light's too high, your eyes take a while to adapt. There's no way you can immediately see your model because it takes several seconds for your eyes to adapt. And during that time, you've got to try and locate where the model is in the sky because you don't always, it's not possible always to have a complete exact image in your mind of where you exactly where you should look if you take your goggles off, if your model's still flying. And remember also that even if you're only a couple of hundred yards away, something like a, a, you know, a small quadcopter, it can be almost invisible against the sky because you're blinded and it's a tiny pinpoint, a tiny black dot against the blue sky, really, really hard to see. Now, there's another group who are also affected here, and those are the people who wear corrective glasses. I'm talking about glasses, not contact lenses. If you wear corrective eyewear and you fly FPV with diopters in your goggles, you can't meet this requirement either because when you take your goggles off, you will then have to get your eyeglasses and put them on your face, something that may take a few seconds. Um, so you cannot comply with this requirement. This is impractical, impractical. Um, you cannot always have the ability to see where the UAV is if your goggles are removed. Impractical, never been done by, this is, no one's ever done this in the FAA. They've never tried flying FPV on a sunny day, ridiculous. Um, and then the FPV flyer and visual observers should have a pre-planned communications and procedures to ensure the UA remains under control and within the visual line of sight during any event when the safe operation of the aircraft is in question. And this takes me back to that other point where it says visual observers must be in direct communication with the FPV flyer. Let me paint you another picture. You're deaf. You, have, you can hear nothing, but you like to fly FPV. So you put your goggles on and you're flying. Now you've got a visual observer beside you. An aeroplane comes into the operation. How does the visual observer communicate to you what you should do? You can't, the, 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 if the deaf FPV flyer cannot see the visual observer's lips. He can't read the lips. He can't hear what he's saying. You might tap him on the wrist, 
but that's not going to give him the information he needs to safely negotiate away from any risk or danger. Now, if he was flying at 500 feet and there was a helicopter coming through at 500 feet, this could be a real problem. And this, you can understand, you shouldn't be doing that if you are deaf and you're flying FPV because you can't hear the approach and you, your observer can't tell you what to do. But what about the fpv -er, the deaf fpv -er, who's flying at 100 feet or 50 feet or, or flying a quad beneath the trees? Well, he's still got to have this visual observer who can communicate what he should do, but it's not possible if you're deaf. So deaf people are prohibited from flying FPV even when it is entirely safe for them to do so. And I think that is utterly unreasonable because the precedent for this is that if you are deaf, you can still get a pilot's license to fly a full-size aircraft. The only restriction being that you must be flying in airspace that does not require the mandatory use of a radio. So Class G airspace, for example, you can get a pilot's license to fly a Cessna 172 in Class G airspace, even if you're deaf. But you cannot fly a 250 gram model of a foam, a foam model of a Piper Cub under the trees on your own property because your visual observer, who is a mandatory requirement, cannot communicate to you while you've got your goggles on. And if you take your goggles off to look at the, um, the, the, the visual observer, you won't be able to see your craft. So it will be no longer visual line of sight. Neither of you will be looking at the model. It's why are deaf people discriminated against in FPV, but not in manned aviation to the same extent? I want an answer from the FAA. The reality is the FAA are just lazy. They haven't thought this through. They haven't come up with these use cases. They haven't figured out the, that there's not enough granularity and that in many cases, a visual observer is completely unnecessary to ensure a safe operation. They're too stupid or they choose not to, to, to be aware of that or to understand that. And that's unacceptable. Okay, now the next example of lunacy in this document is and has been copied directly from manned aviation, which has a totally different risk profile, are the, are the procedures for determining a recreational flyer's medical condition. Because medical condition is important. Certainly in manned aviation it is. You can't go flying a Cessna 172 or whatever if your, your reactions or your thinking or you're physically incapable of controlling that aircraft safely. That's, that's a given. I mean, that's common sense. You know, if you're drunk or you're, you're under some medication, you should not be flying a manned aircraft because there's a very real risk of death, either yours or yours and people on the ground or other people. It is just too dangerous. The risk profile of a manned aircraft is way, way higher than that of a 250 gram scale model of a Piper Cub being flown over a grassy field in the middle of nowhere. But that is not recognized in this document. This is copying stuff directly from the Manned Aviation Handbook and it is ridiculous. So let's have a look. Um, alcohol or prescription drug use, comprehensive safety guidelines should prohibit the recreational flyer from using alcohol or prescription drugs in a manner that would interfere with the recreational flyer's ability to operate the UAS safely. Now, if I'm flying my foam model of my Piper Cub over a grassy field, a 250 gram model over a grassy field in the middle of nowhere, what the hell does it matter if I crash the damn thing because I'm pissed out of my tree? Or if I'm on, on some kind of, um, uh, I've got a cold and I've taken some kind of um, drug that might slow my reflexes. Does it matter if my foam piper cub crashes into a pile of rubbish at my feet? No, it doesn't. It's not like it's a full-size aircraft. The risk profile is so small that this is lunacy. Now, I personally don't drink and fly. I don't take any kind of drugs that would affect my flying ability, not because I consider that will make my flying dangerous, but because I don't want to break my models. It's common sense. Uh, but to put a, a blanket guideline like this, and remember, this applies to models from, from, from one gram through to 55 pounds. Seriously. And if I'm flying a 55 pound model, sure, I'm not going to take any risks. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to take any prescription drugs that might affect my ability. Because if a 55 pound model goes out of control, there's a very real risk that people could die and that other people's property could be badly damaged. But if it's a 250 gram foam model of a Piper Cub, who really gives a damn? So a lack of granularity, it's, it's ridiculous. In manned aviation, there's always a risk that people will die. You lift someone's out, uh, ass 50 feet off the ground and drop it back down again, they're going to die. So 
there's a, there's a very real minimum risk associated with manned aviation. That is, somebody will die. With our hobby, th the risk profile varies dramatically. You take a, a little, you know, Mobula 6 uh, flying around, was it 25 grams? Um, you, you can't do anything with that that's going to endanger anybody's life or property. But you take a 55 pound gasser or a turbine that might fly at, you know, 200 miles an hour and it weighs, you know, 40 pounds. Yeah, that's a very different risk profile. You take a lot more care with that than you do with a Mobula 6 or a little, you know, um, DLG or something. It's just, there's no allowance for that in here. It's, it's because the people who wrote the regulations have never flown these things. They don't understand the huge variety of risk and weights and speeds and flammabilities. All these things that contribute to the risk profile are completely ignored, completely ignored. And that's absolutely unreasonable because if you regulate for the highest risk, then the lowest risk is grossly overregulated. And if you regulate for the lowest risk, then the highest risk is underregulated. You must have regulations that are commensurate with risk, but because there has never been a risk analysis, they don't know what the risks are, so they just copy stuff from the Manned Aviation Handbook. And the next bit is the real proof. I'm safe. The FAA also recommends the inclusion of the I'm safe checklist for recreational flies. Now, this is something directly from Manned Aviation Handbook. So, and the regulators want to show we're really clever. We can make an acronym so you can remember these things. And illness. Is the recreational flyer suffering from any illness or symptoms that might affect the operation of the UAS? Now, yeah, I might have a cold, right? I've got a cold and that makes my eyes run a bit. So, you know, I have to blink a bit. So it, it's not as easy to, to see the model from time to time. I might sneeze, so my eyes close and I momentarily can't see the model. That affects the operation of the UAS. But should it prohibit me from flying it? Really? Seriously? Um, if I'm flying my 250 gram foam model of a Piper Cub, should I be re forbidden to fly it because I've got a cold and I'm sneezing? No, I should not. But according to this, yes, I should. Then medication. Is the recreational flyer taking any drugs, prescription or otherwise, that might affect the operation of the UAS? Again, if it's my 250 gram foam model of a Piper Cub, this doesn't matter one jot. If it's a turbine or if it's a big gasser, yes, yeah, sure. But this is common sense. And this is where you need to have a graded application of these rules. This is very serious stuff if you're flying a large model where there's a large risk. But most of us don't fly 200 mile an hour turbine jets. Most of us don't fly, you know, 150 cc gases. Most of us fly foam models these days. And it's not acknowledged in here. Then stress. Is the recreational flyer experiencing any psychological or emotional factors which might affect his or her performance? And this is this really angers me. One of the things with these lists is that they, they, they go out of their way to try and make an acronym, which is really cutesy and shows how really smart the people are. But in doing so, they just it it makes no sense. Because look at the stress. Um, so is the recreational flyer experiencing any psychological or emotional factors which might affect his or her performance? Okay, but down here they say emotion. Is the recreational flyer emotionally upset? Well, isn't that the same damn thing? An emotional factor, isn't that emotion? Why have you doubled up? Oh, because you wanted to make a smart acronym with an E on the end. Of course, it's not about doing something sensible and practical. It's about showing how clever you are by coming up with an acronym that says I'm safe. We don't have room for this in the hobby. Well, I want sensible, practical regulation and guidelines, not this sort of crap where people just want to show how clever they are, even though they know nothing about this hobby. But let's look back at stress. Now, if being stressed is going to prohibit you from flying, that's going to really piss off a lot of people. I know a lot of people who fly as a release. You know, you get you, you get, spend a day at work and you've been working hard and you're tired, a little bit tired, and you've had an argument with the boss, so you're a bit angry. You go out there, you put your goggles on, or you grab your little 250 gram foam Piper Cub, and you fly around for a few minutes and all the worries disappear, all your cares melt away. You're at one with nature, it's so much fun, it's joyous. And when you land, you're a different person. You're relaxed, you're mellow, you're, you're, you know, all your problems have gone. But according to this, you're not allowed to do that anymore. You've got to remain stressed. You've got to remain emotional. You've got to go home and instead of patting the dog, you've got to kick it. Instead of cuddling the kids, you've got to give them a slap. And instead of kissing the wife, you've got to, I don't know what you're going to do with them. Well, but I mean, this is what I'm talking about. These people have never seen why we fly our models. And I know a lot of people, especially in FPV, flying is their, it's the treatment. It's a treatment. It is a therapy for what ails them. And I know myself, if I'm feeling really down or stressed or whatever, I go and fly FPV and that just changes my mental outlook immediately. It's fantastic. It's just a no drug could accomplish this. But according to this from the FAA, who know nothing, but are going to tell us what to do, we can't do that anymore. If you're stressed, no. 
If you have some kind of emotion, no, you can't fly. This is crap. This is bullshit. This shows how out of touch, as I said, they are and how nonsensical this document is in places. Okay. Um, alcohol. Again, as I said, they want to make a smart acronym, right? They've set up here, um, you can't fly if you're taking recreation, any drugs, prescription or otherwise. And down here they say alcohol. Well, I'm sorry, but alcohol is a drug. It's a recreational drug. Um, so why have you repeated yourself? You've got medication and then alcohol. You know, um, you've got any drugs, alcohol, just like you've got um, stress and emotion. This is the same, same thing. You just wanted that smart ass acronym. We don't want to see how clever you are. In fact, you've proven how stupid you are through all these dumb ass re uh, recommendations here. But anyway, let's look at it. Has the recreational fly been drinking within the last eight hours? What is so magical about eight hours? You can get totally blotto, you can get trolleyed for those who live in the UK, and you can still be so drunk you're not legally allowed to drive a car 12 hours later. It takes a long time for the body to metabolize alcohol. In fact, they say here, full metabolization can take up to 24 hours. So why mention eight hours? What the hell's that got to do with it? It is, or we're smart, we'll say eight hours. No, sorry, that just shows your ignorance. Um, and then they go on to tell us that as little as one ounce of our liquor, one bottle of beer or four ounces of wine can impair flying skills. Does that matter if I'm flying a 250 gram foam model of a pipe cub over a grassy field in the middle of nowhere? Why do you care if I'm just more likely to crash that into the grass? Why does it matter? Again, no granularity, no acknowledgement of the different risk profiles of the different kinds of models we fly, which means this will be flouted with people, people oh, can have a beer and go flying. Or you're at the flying field, it's a hot day, let's have a beer. Oh, no one can fly anymore, I'm sorry. No, it doesn't work that way, it really doesn't. Now, I don't drink and fly because I value my models too much, even my little foam ones, I don't want to crash them. And I know that I'm, you know, not a particularly good flyer at the best of times, so why compromise my skills with alcohol? But I do like a wine and I do like a beer, but I just don't fly after them. But I don't need the FAA feeding me bullshit like this to, to tell me what I can and can't do. It's not, not satisfactory. Now, fatigue, have you received sufficient sleep and adequate rest in the recent past? What is the recent past? Is that the last hour, the last two hours, the last day, week, month, year? It's too vague. It's too vague. Safety, face, safety recommendations should not be vague. They should be precise enough that you can make a determination based on looking at them. Recent past, no, sorry, it, it's inadequate. Right, and this is the next thing. Now, let's get on to this. This is even more dragged from the Manned Aviation Handbook. And let's go down here. Safety event reporting procedures. Someone's done a wonderful copy and paste here, just like in the previous bit. And they've said, to support and promote safety culture amongst all CBOs and recreational flyers, the FAA recommends, but does not require that comprehensive safety guidelines address safety events. CBOs should consider including a safety event reporting requirement for recreational flyers. Depending on the size and mission of the CBO, gathering such data may provide substantial benefits to CBOs as they would better understand the trends and risks proposed by, by UAS, uh, trends and risks posed by UAS, and could use the information to devise appropriate mitigations. Now, it's interesting that they want CBOs to effectively do risk assessments, to analyse the risks, but they're not prepared to do it themselves. The regulators are not prepared to analyse the risks and create regulations proportionate to those risks. No, 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 no. One size fits all as far as they're concerned. Anyway, let's have a look. Do they want you to report injuries to human beings? Oh, well, I was starting my nitro plane and I cut my finger. Well, better report that, right? Property damage in excess of $500. I was flying my $600 plane and it crashed. Whoops, better report that. Loss of control of the UAS due to all these reasons, including, and this is the big one, recreational fly errors. Oh, I was flying and I got disoriented. And for a moment, I didn't know which way the model was going. I better report that. How many times a weekend does that happen in America? There would be thousands of people who, oh, I flew through the sun and I lost sight of the model for a moment and I couldn't say which way it was going, but I saved it. These all, according to the FAA, it's, good. it's a good idea to report these things. And this brings up another problem. You are required to operate under the guidelines and the, the rules of a CBO, um, under these FAA rules. You need to operate under the rules of a CBO, but you don't need to belong to that CBO. You do not need to be a member of that CBO. So you might say, well, I'm going to operate under the AMA's rules because that, that's the CBO I'm choosing to operate under. And remember, when stopped by a policeman or an enforcement officer, you must name the CBO whose rules you're operating under. You must name it. It's a requirement. So you say, oh, I'm going to use the AMA. I am operate under the AMA's rules. And if the AMA says, well, you must do this. You must report these, these events if they happen. <laughs> Can you imagine? 
thousands of people every weekend who are not AMA members contacting the AMA to say, oh, I got disoriented for a couple of seconds the other day and I cut my finger on a prop. Oh, and I, by the way, I crashed my, my plane and it was $600. Um, does the AMA really want to know that? What are the AMA going to do with that? And, and it's like, uh, now in manned aviation, this is really, really important stuff because, for example, if, there's a, if you have a problem with your engine, and you report it to the FAA. And if other people with the same engine have the same problem, then the FAA can go out there and they can talk to the manufacturer or can issue a, a, a no-fly order for that aircraft until the problem's fixed. These things are all really important. Or if they're finding that pilots, new pilots are making the same mistake when they're flying, they can go back to the flying schools and say, you need to revise your training to put more emphasis on this particular thing because people are having a problem with it. These things feed back and they're really useful because every time someone gets in a manned aircraft, their life is at stake. In the case of models, very rarely is anyone's life at stake. So no one gives a damn if you cut your finger on a prop. Nobody gives a damn if you got disoriented with your 250 gram foam model of a Piper Cub while flying on a grassy field because the sun got in your eyes. Nobody cares about that stuff. But if you want to be eyed favorably by the FAA, they recommend this. And so you can bet that CBOs will start following that. And, but this is, say, straight out of the Manned Aviation Handbook, copy-paste, bing, job done, no thought, no consideration of the real issues, unbelievably bad on the part of the FAA. And it, it's to say, this document substantiates everything I've said about regulators, their ignorance, their arrogance, their unwillingness to do the risk assessment and to examine the real problems with regulation that is proportionate to risk. It is just not happening. This document effectively prohibits the deaf from flying FPV and it prohibits people from using FPV as a therapy for what ails them. It's, it's taking away the hobby from a really important group of people and I don't think that is at all reasonable. So what I suggest is you go and make a submission on this draft uh, paper because as I said at the beginning, it is a draft. It is a draft. So go and make a submission on the basis of what I've said here, because it's really important, because this needs to be changed. This needs to be changed, because as I said, all the people, all the organizations that want to become CBOs will just follow this without question, because if you don't, you're not going to get picked as a CBO. And if you're not a CBO, you have no standing with the FAA. You have no standing, you, you have no ability to do a lot of stuff. So get onto this, people, get out there, do it now. And if you're in a country outside the USA, this is not something that's USA specific because all regulators have the same attitude to our hobby. Oh, we're, we're manned aviation, you know, we just copy the stuff and paste it. And we don't need to do a risk assessment. We'll just regulate for the most dangerous aspect of your hobby and to hell with the fact that it destroys the completely safe fun flying at the bottom end because you've got to do all this crap like register and all the other stuff. No, sorry. Not practical. So there you go. That's my video for today. Thank you for watching. Thank you to my Patreon supporters who make it all possible. Go to the comments now and tell me what you think. Have I got it wrong? Have I got it completely wrong? Is it actually um, the FAA's done a really good job here and whatever or not? And spread word of this video because I want everybody to know that you need to make a submission. If you do not, this will just go straight through and a huge section of the hobby will be disenfranchised. If you're deaf, if you use the hobby as a therapy for unwinding at the end of the day, all those things you won't be able to do anymore without breaking the rules. Worth thinking about. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Overregulation is like a tumor. It's killing a hobby. It must be terminated now.